If you are new to the work of the Trinity Forum, we seek to provide a space for leaders to engage the great questions of life in the context of faith and to come to better know the author of the answers. And if one had to pick a patron saint of wrestling with the big questions of life, it would be hard to come up with a more qualified candidate than St. Augustine, the subject of much of our discussion today. This fourth century North African rhetoric teacher, Christian convert, priest, and later bishop shaped the thought and theories of political philosophers and theologians ranging from Aquinas to Hannah Arendt, Reinhold Niebuhr to Friedrich Nietzsche, Kierkegaard to Martin Luther King Jr. But his work is also intensely, sometimes embarrassingly, personal and provocative, such that time spent immersed with Augustine may well wind up, as our guest today has said, as a, quote, spelunking expedition in the caves of your soul. So if this sounds intriguing, well, buckle up, because our guest today extends just such an invitation to us in his recent and fascinating book, On the Road with St. Augustine, A Real-World Spirituality for Restless Hearts. And it's hard to imagine a better guide, not just to the extraordinary works and thought of St. Augustine, but also to the profound questions he poses as to the power of our habits, the longing for home, or the mysteries of the human heart than our guest today, philosopher James K.A. Smith. Jamie Smith, as he is perhaps best known, and is one of the, has been one of the most requested guests on our online conversation series, is a philosopher and professor at Calvin College, the editor-in-chief of the renowned Image Journal, and the award-winning author of Who's Afraid of Postmodernism, Desiring the Kingdom, The Devil Reads Derrida, you Are What You Love, Awaiting the King, Reforming per, uh, Public Theology, as well as his excellent and most recent book, which we've invited him here today to discuss. His popular writings have appeared in publications such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Books and Culture, First Things, and many other uh, publications. And last, but certainly not least, I am very proud to claim him as a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. So Jamie, welcome, it's great to have you. Oh, it's always great to talk to you, Cherie. Even, even in this strange, socially distanced way, it's great to connect. Yeah, it's really fun to have you here. So let me ask you about your own journey leading up to your road trip uh, with Augustine. How does a working class kid from Canada wind up an Augustinian scholar and philosopher? <laughs> Not by plan. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting... I, so I don't want to bore people by going back too far. I, I wasn't raised in the church. Uh, I became a Christian the day after my 18th birthday. I experienced that as a pretty radical sort of conversion. And like many, I think, I thought that meant I was supposed to be a pastor. So I immediately changed my plans. I was always planning to be an architect. I ended up on the road to studying for pastoral ministry and theology. And... Um, while I was an undergraduate, I, I had some first encounters with St. Augustine, who, who is this looming giant in theology uh, in, in the Western tradition. But I'll say it didn't really take, I guess. I met him as kind of a stodgy, dusty, scholastic kind of theologian. In other words, the people who were introducing me to Augustine introduced me to someone else. But then when I uh, started grad school in philosophy, I, I experienced what I, what I sensed was a call not to pastoral ministry, to, but to this more academic vocation. So I headed into grad school in philosophy. And um, the very first semester, I had a teacher who had me read Augustine again. And at that point, I met somebody who saw through me, I would say. There was, there was um, I met this kind of existential co-pilgrim who wasn't just talking about objective theological ideas. He was like taking stock of his own human heart. And I'll be honest, it was also kind of unsettling because it, it started to force me to have to take stock of my heart. I was, I was very comfortable living up in the realm of ideas where I thought I could be smart. Um, I, I was, it was riskier to, to start digging down into the realm of my longings 
Uh, and that's exactly what Augustine propelled me to do. And, th and then the sort of the crowning, uh, um, the, the icing on the cake, so to speak, in God's providence and humor is that when I went on to do my PhD in French and German philosophy at Villanova University in Philadelphia, just up the road from you, uh, I went there to study, you know, French phenomenology, but it turns out that Villanova was an Augustinian Catholic university run by the Augustinian order. There was Augustine scholars all over the place and the philosopher I went to study, it turns out had this entire backstory of an encounter with Augustine. So I really feel like um, God gave me the gift of this ancient friend who, um, is is also somebody I could never come to the end of in that way. So it's been a great gift, I would say. So your description of Augustine in your your book on the road with Saint Augustine is unusual for an Augustinian philosopher. Uh, you kind of it's not an academic book at all. Mm. I think at one point you refer to him as an AA sponsor uh, in terms of his you know kind of being a Sherpa to one's soul. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, you're recommending to your readers that they essentially take a road trip with Augustine. What did you learn on your road trip with Augustine? Yeah. Um, and I have to say, this is what part of what I love about Augustine is he is one of the great intellectual giants of Christianity and, I mean, the Western cultural tradition. But uh, the reason to read Augustine is not just theory. It's because um, he, he is this, this psychologist of the human heart. I think that would be one way to describe it. The, re the reason, yeah, that the AAA sponsor line is, it's like Augustine has tried everything we have tried to make ourselves happy and also mm -hmm. learned that most of them don't work. And so he, he and in that res in respect, it's remarkable how this fourth century, uh, um, you know, uh, um, North African reads like a contemporary for us in the 21st century. There's, it's, it's almost like the perennial longings and hungers of the human heart uh, haven't changed. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. And so I, I think that's probably what I learned from Augustine. Augustine was maybe also, you know, kind of one of the therapists in my life who, who kept trying to get me to ask myself, when you are chasing this, what are you really looking for, right? Like when you want to win, when you want to be noticed, when you want to be envied, when you uh, uh, um, uh, are, are propelled and driven to do all these things, what's really going on under the surface there? And, and the reason why Augustine, Augustine isn't just pointing the finger at me, it's actually, he points the finger at himself. He does this soul work in his own life. And then you're like, oh, these are uncomfortable questions. I need to grapple with them. But but Augustine holds out a gracious hand to walk with you along the way. You know, the questions that you have talked about Augustine posing in many of your works, not just your most recent, but your others as well. Uh, you've said repeatedly that the question that Augustine always says is the most important is rarely the one we ask. It's not what do you do? Where are you from? Who are your folks? It's the question, what do you love? Why is this the most important question? Yeah, there, there's this great line. Lots of people who haven't read Augustine have nonetheless probably heard this line from the very first paragraph of the Confessions where he says, he's praying to God and he says, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And in a way, almost everything about Augustine's insight about our loves is, is caught there because what he's saying is what really drives us, propels us, defines us, moves us, is not just what we think or what we know or even what we believe. It's this, this energy of the heart. It comes down to what are we longing for? What are we looking for? What are we, what do we love? And, and in that sense, um, under the surface of all kinds of claims that we make about ourselves, um, there can be a dissonance because we actually might be loving something other than what we're saying. And, and if that's the, uh, um, you know, a lot of what Augustine testifies to in his life in the confessions is this sense of dissonance in his life. There, he, he almost feels like he's two people. He, he uses all these metaphors of feeling fragmented and torn and, and turbulent. And I think a lot of us can identify with that. 
because we experience this gap between maybe what we think we are about and what we in the corners dark corners of our heart we sometimes realize we might really be about so it's that it's that dynamic that i think is so insightful and and maybe i'll, I'll just say this maybe that's especially important and challenging for those of us who live in vocations that are intellectual vocations too. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we basically think we can think our way out of a problem and we subtly probably fall into the trap of imagining we can think our way into salvation. And Augustine sort of upends that and testifies to that. Well, let me ask you about that dissonance that you mentioned. I'm sure Augustine is probably, was probably more self-aware than many of us, but you know, most of us have had the experience of having conflicted motives and priorities. And it's a struggle to know what we ourselves want at times. Uh, how did Augustine and, and how did you on your road trip with Augustine kind of delve down into actually seeing clearly what you, what you truly want, what you truly love? Yeah, we, we should say, I mean, it is important that for Augustine, this is not just self-help because there is a sense in which what you're really trying to do is open yourself up and make yourself vulnerable to the spirit helping you see this about yourself. And I don't, I don't mean that in any overly pious way. I just mean, we actually can't do this work on our own. And there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful sense in which for Augustine, getting to the point of hope, helplessness is sort of the beginning. <laughs> like getting, getting to the point of realizing you can't fix yourself is the beginning of opening yourself up to grace. The, the, there's a great line from Augustine where he says, the desire for grace is the beginning of grace, which I think is really beautiful. Now, um, I, I think what Augustine would say is, by the grace of God, he's able to undertake this, as you said, the metaphor before, one is he sort of buries down into the caverns of his soul. And he, and he basically, God gives him the grace to start being honest with himself and realizing, well, I thought I wanted to be, uh, you know, this, I, I wanted to work in the emperor's palace as a speechwriter. That was Augustine's story. And, you know, he thought, and he thought if he could achieve that, he would achieve his end because he would get notoriety and fame and power and things like that. And it turns out when he got all those things, it didn't work. So in some ways it was the disappointment of getting exactly what he was chasing that opens him up to saying, I guess I didn't want what I thought. And I was hoping for something else from that. And, and I would say that was my own experience. That started to resonate with me again in really uncomfortable ways. This is, journeying with Augustine is not always a party because he, he asks you, you unsettling questions. And I guess through my own life, I started to realize, let's say you imagine you experience different levels of success and achievement. You actually accomplish all these things you're trying to get to. And then you get onto the top and you look around and you're like, that's, that's it? Is that, this is, why, why do I still feel sad? Why, why is this not sort of working? And I think Augustine gave me permission to then ask myself, um, what did I really want? <laughs> what was behind this quest for accomplishment, this desire for success, this lust for attention? Uh, and, and help me to see well, it, actually, at the end of the day, it's because I thought something finite and created could satisfy what only the creator could. Now, I, I'm talking too long, Shree, but I want to add just one, two more sentences to that, which is this. I will say the other liberating thing about journeying with Augustine in this response, respect is he he's saying, look, this didn't just characterize me when I wasn't a Christian. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's very, very honest that this is still a besetting dynamic of the Christian life. And that's what, I guess I find that really, um, that honesty very inspiring. Because here's a bishop, here's a giant of the church's spiritual tradition who will tell you, he still has mixed motives. He still has a conflicted heart. And so the goal isn't us achieving our purity. It's us confessing 
our dependence on the grace of God in the midst of that. So I am betting that we have a lot of people watching who are already intrigued with the idea of road tripping with Augustine. And I imagine we also have a few people who are feeling some internal pushback in that Augustine was not immune from the errors of his time. And one of the most obvious and glaring and off-putting was his view of women. Um, he questioned whether women had souls, um, questioned whether they uh, or just men were made in the image of God. And so what would you say to uh, other women such as myself who may have some reticence about entrusting their soul to a guide, to a guy who doesn't believe they have one? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You should bring that and put it right in Augustine's face. <laughs> uh, uh, wh one of the things I try to say in the book is, in a sense, to be a faithful co-pilgrim with Augustine is not to just parrot Augustine, but it is in many ways to read Augustine against himself. And within the course of his lifetime, I would say he was trying to do that himself. And so it's interesting to follow the arc of his thinking across a lifetime and how much he has to undo of his own stuff. But he clearly never got there. I, the other thing, the thing theme I press in the book too is I don't think he ever really comes around to what I would consider a, a biblical creation affirming view of sex, for example. And it tells you a lot about Augustine, which is, mm -hmm. man, that's the idol that stayed close right that's the i that's one of the idols that stayed close and so the only way he could imagine avoiding it was to stay a million miles away from even touching it. when it when it comes to his view of women it's it's very very disheartening and unsurprising at the same time given a lot of what was happening in the tradition but then you can read augustine you could see the way you can sort of see the seeds of deconstructing him on this regard when and this i would say is the biggest lesson i learned writing the book the role that Monica, Augustine's mother, plays in his story is ginormous. I mean, it's just like Monica is almost a close second to God in, in the sort of agency of grace that she plays in his life. And um, that's kind of the thread that I would pull uh, to sort of unravel his own take on women to say, actually embedded in what is a biblical vision and affirmation, you can see the seeds of it in, in how he portrays Monica. So I wanna ask you a little bit about cultural liturgies. And then one of the things I love both about this book and your earlier book, You Are What You Love, is the, the element of how what we actually love is both reflected in but formed by what we repeatedly do. Um, our actions largely form our loves. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a time where, uh, you know, people are actually sort of starting to form new habits, thinking about yeah. it. And at one point you propose, uh, it's a very interesting idea, doing a liturgical audit. So what is a liturgical audit? Why should we think about them? And what does it reveal about who we are and what we love? Yeah, and I, I'm so, you, you got the connection there exactly right. The, the, the hypothesis here, the intuition is that it's not because of what we love that we choose to do certain things. There are very, very significant ways in which what we love is the fruit of what we've been doing, right? Our loves are formed as habits that are ingrained on us because of the rhythms and rituals and routines that we give ourselves over to in our lives. So we have to take stock of that. And that's what I mean by the liturgical audit, where what you try to do is you hit the pause button on your everyday immersion, try to get some distance on your own everyday life, and to see the things you do as doing something to you. And you start to ask yourself, okay, what story is carried in this rhythm and ritual? What, what vision of the good life is tacitly enacted when I'm doing this over and over and over again? And you can, you know, you can do this, you can do a liturgical analysis of, of our shopping habits, our media consumption habits, and so on and so forth. Um, the point isn't uh, withdrawal and like stop doing that. It's actually to give us eyes to see and to realize what's at stake in our immersion. And then of course, part of Augustine's answer, part of my own would be, and also to become much more intentional about adopting and deepening 
rhythms, rituals, liturgies in our lives that index us to God and God's kingdom. So th this is why the church to me is the incubator for recalibrating the heart. Uh, and, and in that sense, um, I think Augustine, Augustine was really a progenitor for me in thinking about this way. When he analyzes the Roman Empire in his book, The City of God, what he's doing is he's analyzing the rituals, not the statements. And, and I think that seems like a very good exercise for us today. It is interesting. I still think there's a lot of work to be done on, you're right, the, the ways our rhythms and rituals have changed in the pandemic. It's funny, like just to take a, a, what seems like a trite example, but I would say one of, as somebody who like spends a lot of time traveling on airplanes uh, uh, in airports, I would say the rhythms and rituals of air, of frequent flyer dumb are like, those are not neutral. Those are, there, there's all kinds of loaded dynamics. And, and as somebody, you know, you, as you know, you fly enough and you start getting upgrades and all these kinds of things. And, that, and, and suddenly what I would realize is these rituals are kind of teaching me that I'm important. I'm very important. I sit at the front, you know, and it's amazing. That is not good for the soul. It's not good for my soul. You, you could probably withstand it, but I, oh, uh, it, it is, it is. And so there's probably been a certain grace in that, like for the last eight months, uh, um, the devil hasn't been able to reinforce that narrative in my life. Uh, uh, not that I don't have all kinds of occasions for pride, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it is interesting to then think about what rituals can we be adopting in these seasons too, to be positive countermeasures. You know, I'd love to hear you say more about exactly how it is that what we do affects what we love. You know, many of us may harbor, um, you know, pretensions that it really doesn't matter. I do one yeah. thing, my mind is elsewhere. Uh, I am not affected by these things. I, how is it that we come to love what we uh, habitually do, whether we choose it or not? Yeah. So think of, think of our loves as habits. And as habits, they are these dispositions that are sort of inscribed in us at a largely unconscious level, right? The part of the, it's, it's not that Augustine is a Freudian, but he actually has a deep, deep sense of the kind of unconscious power of the things we're not thinking about. And so in that sense, what that would mean is, uh, um, if I am sort of giving myself over and over again, say to a, a stadium ritual, let's, let's risk offending something. Let, if I give myself over mm -hmm. to a stadium ritual over and over and over again on Friday nights and Sundays and so on, and that enacts a powerful visual visceral story of like national power and military might, you can understand how we become nationalists, not because somebody convinced us of an ideology, but because we have in effect habituated our loves by the ritual that we didn't even know was a liturgy. Does that, does that make sense? I, I also think we, this would be a conversation for another time, but I actually also think this is exactly how to think about the dynamics of racism. That racism isn't just a set of beliefs and an ideology of views that we hold. It's actually a set of litanies and liturgies and rituals that we, we, uh, I would say white people uh, mm -hmm. have subtly been immersed in that have trained us that we are the center of the world. And, and you have to take stock of racism on that register, not just as a set of beliefs. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you back for that conversation because I think there's a lot to un unpack there. Sure. And before too long, we're going to have to turn this over to audience questions. But, um, but the implications of what you're saying is very interesting in that if we as individuals are affected by what we as re repeatedly do, presumably we as a people are also um, affected and shaped and formed by what we repeatedly do. And I'm curious what political or civic liturgies you see as being particularly formative to 21st century American Christians. Yeah. So, by the way, this Augustine completely agrees with this. So, in we we've kind of been talking about the Confessions a lot, but in his later work, The City of God, which isn't there a Trinity Forum reading from The City of God too that Eric Gregory did? Produced by Eric yeah. Gregory. 
And it's from, I think it's from book 19. And in book 19, Augustine says, the definition of a people, a people, a, a republic, a civitas, is a multitude of rational agents united by the common objects of their loves. So if you want to know the, the state of a political entity, a body politic, you also have to ask what they love. And, the, and, he, anal and he says, well, how does a people come to love? By the rituals of the empire, by the rituals of that republic. And I think, um, where to start, right? So there is a sense, I, I'm an I'm a, um, immigrant to the United States, a citizen now for two years, uh, uh, who still really, I, I'm really, I, I can't do the mail-in because uh, I really want the, the liturgical experience of my first vote for president, you know, in person. Um, but uh, I'll say many, I think, outsiders would come to the National Mall in, in Washington, D.C. and would have an experience a bit like St. Paul on Mars Hill, where you go up to this, this temple mount, uh, so to speak, and you look around and you say, I see that you are a very religious people. So our, the United States politics is fraught with a kind of religious fervor. And then I would say that the disheartening and increasingly debilitating liturgies that we've built around this have been uh, polarization into our tribes, which have allowed us uh, to silo into sort of tribal rhythms and rituals rather than common rhythms and rituals. And it seems to me the loss of that, uh, uh, the possibility of more commonality. I, I'm not, I, it's one thing to, to criticize nationalism. That's not the same as, you know, I don't mean to, I'm lamenting the loss of litanies that unite us in common. Uh, and um, we have a lot of work to do, it seems, in that regard. That's one final question. I mean, we are cruising into a nasty election season. It's also the 19th anniversary of 9-11 when we saw uh, the result of long stoked fires of hate. And one of the terms that Augustine used that you talked quite a bit about in various books um, to describe disordered loves that often manifest themselves in a political or civic manner uh, was libido dominandi, the desire to dominate. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something you see increasingly in our own rhetoric. Uh, we talk about owning the libs or the right. <laughs> We talk about triggering our opposition. I mean, it's language that's very explicitly about either subjugation or causing distress. Um, and that language uh, re both reflects and presumably helps form what our future you know, political and civic language would be. So uh, as an Augustinian, what cure or at least mitigation do you see for the libido dominandi, which seems to be distorting and corrupting our current civic practices? Such an important question. My, my, my thought is this. It's interesting for Augustine, the most powerful antithesis to love for Augustine is not hate, it's fear. You'll often see him set up this, this antithesis between love perfect love casts out fear. And I wonder if we would get a little further in understanding the disorder of our political life if we got past the surface symptom manifestation of hate, dug down into the fear and asked, where is that coming from? And I think at that point, Augustine would say, maybe one of the things that's happening is we are over expecting from politics per se. That is, I, I think Augustine, one of, one of Augustine's counsels to us is politics isn't everything. It can never be the final thing. And uh, the healthiest politics will come from recognizing its penultimacy rather than treating it as ultimate. And, and what I worry is the more, uh, to be honest, in some ways, the more secularized our political life becomes, the more we are prone to imagine politics is all we've got. Uh, and then we overexpect and overinvest in it. And Augustine would ask us to have hope 
beyond what we think we could achieve politically. Hope is faith, hope, and love are all the great antidotes to fear. And that, that could be our prayer, perhaps. That's a great note to end on. So with the, the next half hour, we're going to actually take questions from our viewers. I see that we have a bunch that have come in. And just as a reminder to our viewers, not only can you ask a question, you can also like a question. And that helps us give an indication of how popular a question will be. So Jamie, this first question comes from Doug Bratt, who asked- uh, Hey, Doug. I know Doug. And Doug asks whether you think this pandemic is uncovering any new loves we might not have earlier recognized. Oh, what a fascinating question. Um, I wonder how many people find, uh, um, if there's a certain dynamic of absence makes the heart grow fonder, I, I wonder if any of us have come to realize how much we love and long for community in ways that we probably took for granted. Uh, of course, there's all kinds of reasons to talk about rampant individualism, but I wonder if this pandemic has been a season in which we have learned actually how much we are part of webs of relationship. And, and I would add embodied community. Uh, um, I, I don't know about you, and I, I really miss uh, touch. I really miss hugging my friends. I really, you know, the, this, the, the, the holy kiss of church is, um, there's something very dehumanizing about not being able to do that. And I wonder if it's made us more incarnate in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting question to think about. Yeah. So Elena Forsyth from Chicago asked, Dr. Smith, I work for an architecture firm that designs churches, so I'm curious. What would you say about how our environment, architecture, artifacts, yeah. et cetera, shape our loves? Does that kind of passive culture uh, have as much of an impact on our discipleship as someone would, like me would like to think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, um, there, there's, we didn't get to talk about this, but I, I would say the way to the heart is always through the body. That's why uh, the stories and liturgies that most uh, affect us have this kind of visceral kinetic quality about them. And so material environments do a lot to us, which is, uh, by the way, which is one reason to not build churches like malls. Okay, I said it, but because then pe when people are in that material environment, they have been primed for consumption, which is not the way to encounter God. Yeah. Um, I do think there are um, multiple possibilities for how material environments can, can form us. So it doesn't turn into a narrow nostalgia for Gothic architecture, although my heart is strangely warmed in such spaces. But it is, I just think it calls from us a kind of intentionality about creating our spaces. And I'll even say for, for church planters who are meeting in school gymnasiums, that doesn't mean, you know, you're backed into a quarter, you can't do anything. I've seen people do really, really great creative things with the arts to create a wallpaper of worship experience that speaks to that formation. So yes, that's honoring our embodiment to take material environment seriously. That's great. So Richard Miles asks, iconoclasm is in the air for many of us in today's public square. How do we make the case for Augustine when the very concept of Western thought and culture is in jeopardy? Yeah, so I think one of the ways I try to do this in On the Road with St. Augustine is to show the surprising way that someone like Augustine is actually under the surface of all kinds of 20th century thinkers that people think are au courant or, do you know what I mean? Like, so Camus, existentialism, Jacques Derrida, you know, th these kinds of, uh, um, it's so interesting when you scratch under the surface of 20th century questions, it turns out that people asking those questions were encountering Augustine. So I, I, I guess that's my one way of doing it. I don't wanna do it nostalgically. I don't, I don't say to people, you should read Augustine because he's one of the great books, you know, or, or which of, of course you can do. I just don't want to make the case in that way. I want to say, uh, here is somebody who has read your postmodern mail and he's got enough distance on our culture that he might give us fresh eyes to see who we are. 
I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they still read Augustine as part of the curriculum at Columbia University. You know, there is an enduring perennialness and I look for openings like that. Yeah, that's great. So Josh Clough, Clough poses this question. If the church is an incubator of our loves, what are Jamie's concern for a time when many of us are engaging in virtual church? And he, does he have any recommendations for us at this time? Yeah. Um, it's hard, right? Can we all just be honest how hard it is? Um, uh, especially for someone like me who, who has a very strong sacramental theology in that I think God meets us in the stuff of the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have largely been reduced to being spectators of something uh, in, in pandemic worship. Uh, that said, I think constructively, there are still ways that even socially distanced worship can be intentional about pulling together communities, right? That, that we are still a communal gathering and that the rhythms of what we are doing when we are remotely connected to this thing can still be enacting the story of the gospel in a way that takes us through the disciplines of confession and assurance of pardon, that, that brings us uh, the prayers of God's people as a practice of lifting up the world and tuning our own eyes to be concerned about our neighbors. I do think that there's a lot of the rhythm, the formative rhythms of Christian worship that we can still try to enact. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'll, I'll just be honest, I don't know how others have found it, but it, it, there's an exhaustion to it. There's a certain Zoom fatigue to worshiping in this way. And, and I think we pray for uh, a real grace and looking for more intimate communities to kind of sustain us in the meantime. Yeah, that's great. So the next question comes from Scott Crosby and he asks, our longings, i.e. the human heart, both for Christians and non-Christians, lead us to great discontent over things that are not as they ought to be. And we see that manifested today. What are the habits and practices we should cultivate as Christians in order to step into culture in redemptive ways, not for my benefit, but for general flourishing? Mm. Great question, Scott. Hi, Scott. Um, yes, I, I, it's, I'm not sure if I'm on the same wavelength, but for me, the one practice that comes to mind is absolutely crucial is lament. So lament is one of those practices that the church's hymn book called the Psalms teaches us. And what is lament? Lament is this paradoxical blend of naming what's not supposed to be to God yeah. as if God is account and he is accountable for that, right? So that there's an anger mm -hmm. and a protest that characterizes lament that I think, especially maybe the, those in evangelicalism, evangelicalism have been a bit timid, like, like mm. that's inappropriate to say to God, in which case they obviously have not read the Psalms. Uh, so if you read the Psalms, you'll learn part of a faithful response is that anger and lament. And I think the church lamenting publicly can be a gift to a wider society because there's a, here's the difference, but lament isn't just anger. It's anger that then always has this cadence of hope that's echoing in the back of it. And we act out of the hope. So we lament and protest and work against the way it's not supposed to be. And we work and act and, and build policy and build institutions with the hope of, of foretastes of shalom. And I think pulling those things together and, and I know Scott knows this. I will say, I think the arts are a particularly powerful um, arena that, that holds those things together in certain ways. If I remember correctly, I think you once lamented that there was not more lament in Augustine. Yeah, that's true. It, it is the, the one piece of Augustine, another piece of Augustine I find slightly frustrating is he has a little bit of a tendency to treat the problem of evil like philosophers do, which is, hmm, how can we figure this out? Uh, it's in his sermons, however, when you see him pastorally caring for people who are facing this, you will see him enact the, the lament of the Psalms and the cross as really the only possible way to give any sort of account of, of evil and injustice that both 
names the justice and hopes otherwise. So yeah, that's another place to deconstruct Augusta a little. That's great. So the next question comes from Mickey Jordan. And Mickey asks, I have a worry about Augustine's point about nothing finite can satisfy us when we were created for the infinite. If this is the case, what roles do relationships, enjoying God's creation, traveling, reading fiction, et cetera, play? Are these things only meant to satisfy us insofar as they point to God, or can they satisfy us in and of themselves? Great question. So, um, yes, this is very important. It's a dance for Augustine. You can't, the difference is, um, see this, now I want to go into teaching mode and I want a chalkboard, but you can't, it's not that things are bad. It's not that finite objects are the problem and you have to get past them. It's if you cling on to them as if they are the only thing, the ultimate thing. And uh, instead, so instead of grasping them and holding on to them and, less, and saying, this finally will make me happy, what you do is you receive it open-handedly as the good gift the creator made it to be. And when you receive it open-handedly, it's not an idol. In fact, it becomes an icon through which we are pulled to enjoy God. And I, I think that dance is very, very important. It's why Augustine is not like, hate the world in order to love God. It's if you love God, you can actually receive the gift of the world and all the gifts it includes for what it is and not the idol it sometimes, we, we make it out to be, yeah. That's an inadequate answer, but in our time, that's that we'll have to do. So Michael Hall asks, he says, I lead training efforts for youth ministry leaders. What general counsel would you offer to help youth ministry leaders help parents in the church nurture or raise the next generation in a new way, not how it's been stereotypically done over the last 50 years? <laughs> Somebody might be trying to bait me here, but so I'll say this. The first thing is, multi-generational worship, multi-generational worship. And what I mean is one of the, the, the I'm trying to think of a kind adjective. One of the bad ideas of the last 30 years was the segmentation of the churches by age. Uh, I, I think research, by the way, by Christian Smith at Notre Dame shows this too. That, that is a debilitating strategy for building faith enduring faith in young people. What they need to do is be immersed in a multi-generational community where they are seeing and meeting mentors who are further down the road and they see a sincere faith. Second thing I'll say is this, don't be scared of young people's questions. Don't, don't be scared to give them room to doubt because if you are, they know you've got something to hide. So I think it's really, really important to realize God is not scared of our questions. The Psalms are full of such questions. God takes that doubt and then responds in, in, in gracious ways. The, the last thing I'll say is this. Instead of entertaining youth to try to keep them in the building, treat them seriously enough to invite them into the spiritual disciplines of the Christian tradition so that it, you're not just making it fun. Um, you're not just entertaining them. You're actually ingraining practices and disciplines and they won't like it they, they they don't have to be excited about it but don't underestimate how much formation is going on even in resistance and, and i say that as a as a parent too that's great so fritz heinz and ask what are your favorite writers on augustine uh so th this is going to be a, a bit strange but um one of the people who really broke open augustine for me uh, was not a Christian commentator. It was Hannah Arendt, uh, the great uh, um, German emigre scholar who came out of uh, Germany in the 30s. And when I, she did her dissertation, surprisingly, you know, this great, great uh, uh, analyst of totalitarianism and so on. She actually did her dissertation on St. Augustine. It was called Love and St. Augustine. And that reading of Augustine really broke open Augustine for me. Um, and I also, I want to make a plug for a friend uh, named Gregory Lee, who's working at Wheaton College right now, who's doing some fascinating reading of Augustine on things like mass incarceration and things like that. And, and Greg is also reading Augustine as this engaged uh, uh, intellectual who's, who's uh, um, 
involved in the life of the church and the life of the world. So uh, just a couple of suggestions. Yeah. So the next question comes from Maria, Mariana Cloca Alves Passos. And I hope I have not mangled your name, Mariana. What habits and rituals should Christians build to keep the Christian identity during a time like this when churches are restricted? Yeah, you know, um, this is, this is uh, where, uh, as I think I've told you before, I think the future of the faith is ancient. And I, I think one of the most important moves for faithful Christianity in the 21st century is for us to remember the disciplines, habits, and practices that we forgot in modernity. So in that sense, um, uh, if, if, if the difficulty of gathered worship feels like we're losing that, I, I think something like the Liturgy of the Hours, um, uh, the, the ancient spiritual disciplines that have been, you know, laid out by folks like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and others. I think those are places to go uh, as long as they don't just turn into an individualist project. Look for little communities to be able to do that and to realize we don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We mostly just have to remember practices that we sort of forgot, especially as Protestants, I would say. So it appears we have several questions wanting to pick up on your statements about cultural liturgies and racism. And so I'll sort of combine a question from Nick Buckner and Dan uh, Abayehu. And Dan asked, Jamie, could you expand on your point on cultural liturgies as it relates to ra racism? What are those formative rituals or habits? What is the disordered love? And how does it speak to ongoing conversations about systemic racism? Yeah, so you could think of this on different levels and different registers. But um, so uh, George Yancey, a f philosopher who has, has done a lot of work on this, has a book called Black Bodies, White Gazes, in which he, well, I think one of, he's a phenomenologist like I am, and he has these really powerful analyses of the very subtle, un- explicit but tacit rhythms and rituals that characterize uh, um, intimate spaces where white people have have sort of learned that they own the room if you know what I mean I'm not doing a very good job he, he has this one or or, or he talks about a, a, an effect that he calls the elevator effect where mm -hmm. is he, he'll say if I'm a black man and I'm on an elevator by myself and a white woman gets on with me I see her clutch her purse I see just the, the hint of movement in her shoulders of tension. And I realize she, if you ask, am I a racist? Of course, she's going to say no. But the question is, has she been tacitly trained to have these perceptions of her neighbor? That's part of the challenge. If we thought on, uh, so uh, that's not adequate, but it gives you some hint. If we thought of this on a macro scale of like policy level, now, something like redlining and segregation in real estate, or just even since redlining is quote unquote technically illegal now, uh, 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 I know my city is terribly segregated. So that three blocks that way and four blocks that way, it's another world. We just need to realize that to move and inhabit spaces in which our environments are still largely dictated by race, and racial realities is doing something to me. Whether or not I affirm it, accept it, believe it, that's almost irrelevant. The question is, what does it mean for me to move through these rituals and absorb it? Um, media portrayals of, of um, uh, Black Americans, right? What, what stories have I absorbed for 50 years based on media consumption? It's that kind of level that I think we need to do a better job of taking stock of. Not, not that that will solve it. I just think that's the beginning of people realizing if, if you only think of racism as an ideology, you can kind of comfort yourself and say, well, I don't think that. And, and I'll believe you, I'm sure that's true. It doesn't mean you haven't absorbed a story on this unconscious level that you are living out in subtle ways that we haven't taken stock of yet. Certainly that's what I, I, I know I need to grapple with in my own life. Mm -hmm. 
Sadly, our time is rapidly ticking by, but we've had a lot of questions interested in some of your own personal cultural liturgy. So I'm going to combine two different questions. Uh, one from Mariam Bell, who asked, what new liturgies have you developed during COVID? And one from Debbie Comer, who asked, how have your personal habits changed since studying and writing about Augustine? So let's see. Uh, um, I, I'm wondering... <laughs> the, the one habit that's probably happened during COVID is I don't want to brag about, which is probably it's happy hour more often, <laughs> which is not good. Um, I'll, I'll say, uh, I think one practice I've been thinking about a lot this year is Deanna, my wife Deanna and I, who you know, have a garden, a urban garden plot at a big community garden in the center of town. And this year, because we can't travel anywhere, it has been immaculate. <laughs> We've been, and and um, for, for us, gardening is this really, it's a, it really is a liturgy, like it's a practice because, and I would say it's a, it's a practice of being attuned to the creator because I'm subject to the creation in different ways. It's, it's an interestingly decentering experience because I know that I am not the sovereign Lord based on all the things I have to fight at the garden. Do you know what I mean? Like, but it's also um, been a great gift for us in terms of being a contemplative space and a shared space. So it's something we do together, which has been important, but it's also this beautiful cross-cultural section of our city where we um, are shaped, I think, in significant ways. We'll ask one more question from our viewers. This comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, how does social media play into the love of unindividuated masses of humanity versus the person sitting across from us? We can't close out the session without discussing social media, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's isn't it interesting? Our, the way we've had to grapple with technology and the pandemic, on the one hand, this is possible. And so we're having meaningful conversations. I think part of what Augustine would analyze in, in the liturgies of social media is the way anonymity functions mm -hmm. to allow us to other human beings. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there's something about, and then it creates a weird confidence in us that I think is almost always misplaced. So that, that would be part of the analysis of it. Um, and, and, um, the trick is how to learn to both love my neighbors who are proximate, but realize that I'm embedded in webs of systems and structures that also make me obligated to people around the world. And that, that's part of what we're still working through, I think. Mm -hmm. Let's let Augustine have the last word. This is um, a, a marvelous picture uh, from the end of book six of the Confessions. This is from uh, Sarah Rudin's new translation, which is quite wonderful. Oh, the twisted roads I walked. Woe to my outrageous soul that hoped for something better if it withdrew from you. The soul rolls back and forth onto its back, onto one side and then another, onto its stomach, but every surface is hard and you're the only rest. But look, he says to God, you're here, freeing us from our unhappy wandering, setting us firmly on your track, comforting us and saying, run the race, I'll carry you. I'll carry you clear to the end. And even at the end, I'll carry you. That's a grace-filled picture we can take with us. Godspeed, everyone. It is indeed. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Have a great weekend.